So my name is Brendan Hurd. I'm with uh, GH Technologies, and today we're going to be discussing the Leica EZ4 stereo microscope. Um, I have the stereo microscope here. This is what it's going to look like when you pull it out of the cabinet. It's going to have the dust cover on. This cord will actually be wrapped up. I've already plugged it in down below the table here. So when we uncover the microscope, you'll notice something right away. On the back side here, we actually have a nice handle. This is for carrying. For anybody else who might be taking out microscopes, putting them away. There's also a cutout in the front of the microscope so that you can use two hands. Students always carry microscopes with two hands, less likely to drop them. Very easy to grab those handles both with the dust cover off and the dust cover on, so you don't need to take the dust cover off before you put the microscopes out on the table. This is the microscope itself. Um, very simple, easy, intuitive layout. You've got your eyepieces up top. Um, two knobs on the microscope, both on the left and right side for left or right-handed operation. The black knob in the back is for your focus. You'll see the microscope move up and down as I twist that knob. And then the white knob is going to be your zoom. As I twist it, we're going to increase our magnification and decrease accordingly. On the right-hand side of that white knob, um, we can actually see here there are markings for how much magnification we're using. Um, so that way the student knows where they're at in terms of magnification. So the magnification range for the EZ4 microscope is from 8x up to 35x. Um, and that's fixed with a 10x eyepiece. When we talk about the eyepieces, the eyepieces do adjust width-wise because everybody has different sized heads. So we want to make sure we can comfortably see through the microscope. It does also have rubber eye cups on them. Right now I have them folded down. These are what we call high eye point eyepieces. What that means is, is the focus point is actually a, right about here on the microscope. Older microscopes you might, have, might remember having to put your eyes right down next to the lenses to see things. In this case, we actually want our eyes a little bit further away. This was designed for people like myself who wear eyeglasses. So when I actually look through the microscope, I'm going to put my glasses right on the eyepieces um, in, a, in a manner such as that. That's going to put my eyeballs in exactly the right place um, to focus and see a nice, nice clean image. If I'm not wearing glasses, I'll take mine off for a second. We can flip the eye cups up, and now we're able to put our actual eyes right on, right on the edge of those eye cups, and it's going to put our eyeballs pretty much in exactly the same place again, allowing us to see a nice clean image and be comfortable at the microscope, which is probably the most important thing. So we have a couple of different illumination techniques with this scope. We have what we call a reflected illumination or light from the top down, and then we have transmitted light or light coming up from the bottom, depending on the sample you're using. The control, controls for the light are here on the back right-hand corner of the microscope. So there is a power switch on the back of the microscope. We'll flip that up to bring power to the microscope, of course, making sure we're plugged in and plugged in nicely in the back here, too. There's a control panel here on the back right-hand corner of the microscope with four buttons. One button controls the light from below, the transmit light. That's the button. It has a little light bulb with a line above it indicating light from below. If I hit that button, we turn on our transmitted light. There's a plus and a minus, fairly intuitive. Plus will increase, the, increase our lighting intensity, and minus will decrease our lighting intensity. And I hit that same button again to turn the transmitted light off. For reflected light, we actually have a few different options. We can um, if I hit the button first time, you'll see there are five LEDs. If I pull this up a little bit, five LEDs on the underside of the microscope. We have two directly next to the lenses, and then three kind of in the back here. So when I hit the button the first time, all five LEDs turn on. It's going to give us a nice, bright, even illumination from the top and the back a little bit, really light up that sample well. When I hit the button the second time, it's going to turn off the bottom two LEDs. That's going to give us a really nice top-down illumination without casting any shadows from the back. And then if we're looking at maybe a, a smoother surface, or a rock, for example, um, we can hit the button a third time, and we're going to turn off those upper three LEDs and turn on the bottom two, giving us a little bit of an angled light. Really shows surface defects, scratches, and topography very nicely. And again, if I hit it one more time, that'll turn the light off entirely. So three options with the reflected light. We can have all five LEDs on, the top three on, looking light from straight down, or the back two on, light coming in from the back, casting shadows. Just as before with the transmitted light, we have intensity control, so we can turn the light down or turn the light up using the plus and minus buttons on the control panel. But in unique cases, we can have the top lights on and the transmitted light on as well. They're not exclusive. You can turn on all the lights if you want. And I encourage you to play with this. You know, every time you put a sample on there, try different techniques, because sometimes you know, what works well for one sample may or may not work very well for the next. Um, so in terms of actually using the microscope, it's f just like any microscope you've probably used before. I'm going to roll these eye cups back down because I am going to wear my glasses. 
We'll take our sample here. In this case, it looks like I got a little moth and a dragonfly. And I'll put them on the base here. Another thing to note about the base is it is water resistant. So if you do have a sample that's in water um, or a solution of some kind, you don't have to worry too much about it sloshing out of your Petri dish. This uh, dragonfly has pretty translucent wings, so I'm actually going to keep the light on from underneath as well as some of the light on from the top because I'm, I want to bring out as much detail as I can. Bring the microscope down, get it in what I think might be a general focus point, and I'll go ahead and look through the microscope. I always start at the lowest magnification. Um, at the lowest magnification, it's going to be easiest to focus. It has what we have the, the great, what we call the greatest depth of field. So it has a very wide range of area that it's going to be focused in. At the higher magnifications, there's a very much thinner area, much smaller area that the microscope will actually be focused in. So I always start on the low magnification, get a general, general focus, and also a general idea of where my sample is. If I'm looking, you know, I've got a big dragonfly here, and I'm interested in a very specific part of the wing. It's hard to find that part at high magnification. So start at low, and then work your way up. Starting at low magnification, you'll get your microscope in focus. Once you've got that, you can start to move your magnification up a little bit. Make smaller increments in your magnification, which will allow you to make just small adjustments in your focus to keep everything nice and clear as you're looking through the microscope as you work your way up in magnification. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And I'll go all the way to the highest magnification and get my wing in focus here. This microscope's what we call parfocal. So once I'm in focus at the highest magnification, I will be in focus the entire way back to the lowest magnification. Something that's very nice and, and can save you a little bit, bit of time and effort. When, again, once you're in focus at the highest magnification, all magnifications below that will stay in focus. And that holds true even if you only go halfway up on the, on the magnification. If you go to 15x, for example. If you're in focus there, at, when you back it down to 5x, that will stay in focus as well. So now if I twist that knob all the way back, I didn't look at the microscope, but I can look through and go, yep, we're still in great focus. One of the things that I noticed with this microscope as I am using it right now is that the focus knob is a little bit loose. And when I say loose, meaning that the microscope body, if I, you actually see if I push on the top here, it goes down without me pushing very hard. This can be a problem sometimes causing what we call focus drift. Sometimes the microscope, the weight of itself can actually unfocus the microscope. This system has what we call self-tensioning knobs. So if you find that to be the case, you can just grab the two knobs and twist them counter. Um, you're going to be twisting both of them in a, uh, I guess it would be clockwise manner. And that will actually tighten the gearing. Um, which will make it a little bit tighter, so you won't have, to, won't have to worry about the focus drift. If you tighten it too far, if it goes too far, you can just go the other way, and it will loosen it up, and it'll be nice, nice and smooth. So with this microscope, we, pro we shouldn't see any illumination issues. Um, these are, all these microscopes are LED-based. They've got a 25,000-hour life. I actually ran the numbers once. I believe if you were to use it eight hours a day, five days a week, you'd get like 18 years out of it. If you do happen to look through the microscope and you're not seeing a crisp, clean image, even after you focus and you can't seem to get the image in focus, it's likely that something is dirty. There's only two places on this microscope where things can get dirty, um, and they're the ones you would think. So either the eyepieces up top or the lens down on the bottom. And most likely in a student environment, somebody took their thumb and stuck it right there or underneath there. Easiest way to clean it, there's a, there's a few things you can use to, to clean the microscope. The first and safest bet is always some form of compressed air, just to see if you can, whatever particulate may be on there, you can blow off. Of course, if someone's put a thumb on there and they've got fingerprint grease on it, that's not going to do us any good. So if the compressed air doesn't work, I usually go to something like a micro microfiber cloth like this, or I, like I said, an industrial cotton Q-tip, they're very finely t uh, wound cotton Q-tips, um, and just give things a nice light, gentle wipe, um, starting there. So I did both eyepieces here. And then we can even do the underside of the microscope. Again, well, I, I'll twist this up so I can get some space. And look at, there's two actually two lenses on the bottom here. And just very gently wipe them. And then after you've done that, again, take a look. Put your sample back on the microscope. Take a look and see if you've solved the problem. So the progression is first to try it dry. Your biggest worry is always to scratch the lens. And if you put things on there, um, you can create almost like a little slurry that can then scratch the lens. So start dry first, and again, always be gentle. The next, be the second, the next best thing, and actually the first thing of something to put on there, is what you would do with your glasses: breath. Just, a, just again, a light breath. It's going to get a, just bring a little moisture to the party, um, which will allow you to hopefully get that oil off there. 
From there, you can go to more abrasive cleaners, but keeping in mind that things that are alcohol-based, acetones, isopropyl alcohol, are all going to have adverse effects on things like plastic and rubber. So if you do have to use those, um, make sure that they're not in contact with that for long. Or if you're doing the eyepieces, pop those rubber eye cups off so you're not getting you know, those alcohol-based things on the rubber because it will start to eat the rubber over time. Um, and again, you can just very gently with the microfiber cloth get in there. These eye cups come off real easily. They're the only part of the microscope that does come off. So if they do come off, not a big deal. I find it easier to, easiest to put them back on by actually unrolling them so you can kind of see which side is which. So if I unroll this one, if you look into the eyepiece, you'll see on one, there's kind of a, a rubber ring that's a little smaller. And on one side, you'll have, you know, five or six millimeters of rubber of the eye cup. On the other side, there'll only be a couple. Um, on the smaller side, that's the side that goes down around the edge of the eyepiece itself to hold it onto the microscope. So you'll figure out which side is which. And it's actually pretty obvious if you try and put it on here, you'll see that it just kind of goes over and comes off again real easily. The other side, you have to kind of stretch it out and kind of fit it over the eyepiece of the microscope. Let's do it for both eyepieces. Oops. There we go. So once you're done using the microscope at the end of the day, either students or instructors, depending on how your classroom is set up, um, you're going to want to properly shut down the microscope. To do that, I'll remove my sample first. First thing I'll do is using my control panel in the top right here, uh, turn off the lights. So in this case, I actually have all of my lights on. I have the transmit light on, so I'll hit that button first. It turns off the, the light on the bottom. And I know that I have all five of my LEDs on, so I'll have to hit the upper button, uh, I believe, three times to cycle through the other modes before it turns off. Now the lights are off. The microscope itself is still on, so we'll just flip the power switch off, no problem. We can unplug, unplug the microscope. And we've got this nice cord wrap here on the back, so we'll just kind of coil the cord up in a uh, somewhat neat fashion. And then take our Velcro cord wrap, which is attached to the cord, so hopefully it doesn't get lost. And I'll just slide it back, give it a quick wrap around the cord itself. Um, and then in terms of storage, I like to keep the eye cups rolled back. They make it caught on a dust cover or the the edge of the cabinet or something, they're just less likely to get caught on stuff if you roll them back. Good to go there. Grab our dust cover just to keep things off the microscope as much as possible. Toss it over, get nice and neat. And then when it's ready, when we're ready to actually put it back into the cabinet, again remember the handles I pointed out at the beginning. You can find the handle here in the back with one hand and the cutout on the front with the other hand. Pick it up, carry it over to your cabinet or the counter or wherever the microscope needs to be stored. So if you have any questions at all, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. My name is, again, Brendan Hurd, or you can contact Randall Chen at JH Technologies, and Natalie has our contact information.